Hi, good morning, everybody. I am super excited for you to join Data is Love. Um, it's Monday morning, and I'm chatting with one of my favorite people in the world, uh, Laura Price. She's the CEO of The Intentionalist. She's a good friend. She's a sci-fi lover. Um, those are, I think, all of the most relevant details for you to know about Laura. Um, the conversation that we have during this half an hour is really focused on um, data-based storytelling to activate, to empower, and to have greater accountability in how work happens and how we make decisions. So Laura, welcome and thank you for joining me. Um, for anybody listening that doesn't already know, um, can you tell us what The Intentionalist is and why did you start it? Well, good morning, everyone. Laura Kleiss, my pronouns are she, her. And at Intentionalist, we believe that where we spend our money matters because people matter. And as a result, everyday decisions about where we eat, drink, and shop are an opportunity to connect with and contribute to the small businesses and the diverse people behind them at the very heart of our cities and communities. Okay, so earlier, like I heard you use the term Wall Street versus Main Street, right? And I've heard you say, you know, like we should be supporting businesses on Main Street. And as a as an immigrant, like I don't always know what that means. Like, so will you tell us a little bit about like what is what is Main Street when you say that? Well, we all know, as you mentioned, that the past couple of years, uh, the data tells us, have been pretty good for Wall Street businesses. We're talking about large corporations um, and the billionaires who run them. In contrast, uh, Main Street are small businesses. Um, they employ the majority of Americans. Um, and in, in specific to Intentionalist, we're really focused on the brick and mortar small businesses whose existence, whose contributions to the local economy go beyond just the jobs that they provide and the products and services for sale, and also include the ways that they facilitate economic mobility, the ways that they hold space for and offer a sense of belonging uh, to a diversity of people. And then in addition, the ways that they as a result of being a part of our communities, intuitively give back uh, and take care of all of us. Um, okay, say more about take care of all of us, right? Like what is it about the Main Street or small business ecosystem that, yeah, uh, that, that's taking care of individuals and like the community at large? So I think to get really tangible. Uh, mm -hmm. If we look back to the onset of the pandemic in America, and we think about all of the kind of stay home, stay healthy orders, uh, the impact on uh, access to food security, access to a whole variety of different social service needs that suddenly came into question, at least here in Seattle, we saw small business owners think not just how am I going to survive? Um, and I think in particular of a collective of independent restaurant owners who, you know, on day zero, were asking the question, who are the members of our community most in need and how mm -hmm. are we going to take care of them? And, you know, uh, a couple of examples, uh, there's a Filipino owned restaurant called Musang, uh, there's a black owned restaurant called Communion, both of which uh, have been in the headlines recently as a result of their culinary prowess. But early in 2020, um, these businesses were in their infancy and at what must have been a really terrifying time, they weren't thinking about their bottom line or their profitability or the fact that these women of color's dreams held in the balance, uh, they were thinking about folks that were going to need to continue to access food 
there are other businesses who stepped up uh, to provide support for frontline healthcare workers. But I think that really at the heart of all of this, right, are the connections between people and the fact that we show up for one another in times of need. I love that, that there's a connection between people. I also heard you say, um, I also heard you talk about like the the sort of dreams of women of color um, business owners being put on hold, right? Um, and they're showing up to support the community and to support like really immediate needs, like feeding people. And it makes me think of the term that I've heard you use before, which is economic allyship. Um, and will you say more about what that means? So before, before I go there, just super quickly. Yeah. I think that it's also important to underline the difference, which is why, right? What is the why behind small businesses? And in many instances, in most instances, the why is the expression of a dream. And that dream may be to share my culture uh, through the food in my cafe. It may be dreams of you know, immigrant business owners for economic stability and mobility for their families. It may be the dream of continuing uh, to take up space in a rapidly gentrifying neighborhood. And I think that because service and the fulfillment of access and opportunity are the why behind these businesses, those whys are universal. And I think therefore in times of crisis and need translate from small business owners to the recognition of our shared humanity, um, which segues into why in many ways intentionalist is about economic allyship. And when I think of allyship, I think of three things. I think of awareness, I think of education, and then I think of action. And as we're talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, as we're talking about racial justice, um, I mean, it was Dr. Martin Luther King who talked about the ways in which racial justice and economic justice go hand in hand and are inextricable. And so in a world where we recognize the connection between justice, inclusion, equity, and not just those concepts as words or those concepts as policy, but those concepts as opportunities for individual action. When I talk about economic allyship, I'm speaking to what it is that each of us can do to actively raise awareness, increase our education, and take action on an individual basis to help close the gaps for small business owners, especially those owned by folks from underrepresented, underestimated communities. And now you can ask me about the data. Before I, I go to talk, asking you about the data, you know, like it just strikes me as I'm hearing you talk about how small business owners show up. And I, I know that like you're on the ground every single day and you've been pretty much on the ground every single day since the start of the pandemic, like meeting with business owners, advocating for them. Um, it's, it makes me think of an article that I read really recently, which was a, a critique of philanthropy and a billionaire philanthropy in particular, where you know they were gonna throw out numbers like, we're contributing $500 million to X and Y cause. And this article said, yeah, on the face of it, it seems like so much money, right? Because the median income in the United States is somewhere between forty and $60,000. So for someone earning, let's say roughly 50 grand a year, Five hundred, five hundred million is a huge amount. But when you look at the overall net worth of that individual, oftentimes it's like less than a percent of a percent, right? And so, what seems like this big, incredible, charitable act, it, it actually isn't. When you look at it in comparison to what they're earning and they have in their net worth, and I, 
And I think that the reverse is true. And I like, I'm guessing, I don't know the numbers, but I'm guessing that the reverse is true for small businesses, right? Like when Musan decides to feed the community, it isn't like a percent of a percent of it like their right like their ability to give back it probably is like a significant portion um it's for going other kinds of revenue to feed people to show up for people and so that's just something that, that i'm sitting with because it's so easy to look at big numbers sometimes that are coming from philanthropy or from wall street and imagine that there is a lot of generosity and allyship there but in reality really is like the smaller businesses in our community that are making some really huge sacrifices for the community. Yeah, two things that I would add to that. Um, one is that I think that we have a tendency, um, myself included, to think about the money we spend in terms of, you know, two buckets, right? There's my philanthropic do-good bucket and then there's the other bucket that I use, you know, to pay for my life. Um, and I think that um, that's the wrong way to think about it because just by being a little bit more intentional about how we spend the much bigger bucket of resources that we use to live our lives, we can align our philanthropic values with those dollars and affect even greater change, right? And so it isn't the case that if we want to do good with our money that we're limited uh, to philanthropy. And then the other thing that I would say is just to kind of put some numbers into context, right? When we look at Small Business Saturday in 2021, American consumers spent over $20 billion in a single day at small businesses. Again, just by being a little bit more intentional. And so when we talk about the transformational impact of more intentional spending, right, we're talking about trillions of dollars. Mm, $20 billion, right? And that's in one day. And so how, you know, how do we keep that going, right? How do we make it I have so many questions, but I want to ask you one, which is, what is the impact for women? And I would, I want to ask you, you know, like in particular for women of color, what is the impact when we spend with local businesses? And it's not just where we eat, although I have to say, I think like both you and I are like deeply obsessed with food, but women own all kinds of businesses. Mm -hmm. They own like auto repair shops and yep like, you know, fitness facilities, and there are accountants, there, there are many different things. But ultimately, when I choose to spend with a woman of color owned business, what is the impact to her, um, her family, the community? So the, the short answer is that the data is a little bit dated. Um, and that's a whole nother kettle of fish, so to speak, uh, because there needs to be a lot more research and robust data gathering when it comes to businesses owned by people of color. Um, but setting that aside for the moment um, and looking at uh, the most recent data uh, to which we have access, which was a report in 2019, um, the state of small businesses owned by women report. Um, what we saw at that time, and granted this was pre-pandemic, but I think that you know, the trends are, are nonetheless pretty telling, right? We saw that the number of women-owned businesses was outpacing the average number of small businesses being started writ large. So that's encouraging. Um, and then we know that the number of businesses being started by women of color was double that of the average small businesses being started by women. So I think that then the next area that we look at is, okay, so we're seeing more businesses started by women. We're seeing more businesses, even more businesses started by women of color, but then so what, right? Mm -hmm. And so 
this is where I get super passionate because I think that we talk a lot about uh, gender wealth gaps. We talk a lot about racial wealth gaps. And the reality is that small business ownership is a huge part of that problem and solution. Um, so the average revenue uh, for all women-owned businesses was about $140,000, again, according to this 2019 report, right? Gross revenue, when you, not like the take-home. The average the total average revenue. Gross, total revenue before for you meet your women owned, For women-owned businesses was $142,900. Okay, but then when you look at what the average is for businesses owned by women of color, it drops to $65,000, well, $65,800. And so again, folks can look up the report and read through the granularity, um, but suffice to say the same trends that we see around uh, inequities when it comes to what women and women of color are earning uh, in the workforce, those disparities show up in average revenue for women-owned businesses, for businesses owned by women of color. And I think that what's, what's exciting is that that is something that each of us can do something about. We may not be in a position or we may be in a position to change, you know, corporate policy around pay equity, um, which deserves ongoing focus and attention. But when it comes to the average revenue for women owned and women of color owned small businesses in our community, right? We can put our, our collective thumb on the scales of economic justice today or tomorrow, because all it takes is supporting a women-owned or women of color on business in your community. Well, I love that. Um, and you know that I love using intentionalists to find places for lots of different kinds of things. Like I found my massage therapist through intentionalists. Obviously, lots of places to eat, um, physical therapist, chiropractor. Um, and I know that as an individual, like I'm only going to spend so much, right? Even as somebody with a lot of privilege and the ability to pay a, a little bit more or like it perceived a little bit more. Um, but I think that companies, they often have a bigger wallet. Right. So what can companies do if I am making purchasing decisions on behalf of my organization? What can I do to support small local businesses? Um, and like, who are you seeing? Like, what are the companies even here in our like Seattle area that you see that doing well? Right. Companies that are supporting intentionally and sustainably small businesses. So while corporate supplier diversity programs have been in place for decades and are definitely an important part of closing gender and racial revenue gaps uh, for small businesses, um, I'd love to set supplier diversity over here for a moment because mm -hmm. I think that especially, you know, in the wake of the pandemic, you know, in a context where we are talking more about racial economic inequities, supplier diversity is showing up in corporate conversations about like, what do we do? And I think that that's fantastic. And I think that more needs to be invested and targets and goals can always be more ambitious where intentionalist comes in is that corporate supply chain programs historically haven't touched Main Street small businesses, right? They haven't touched the businesses whose windows went dark over the course of the pandemic and whose presence is an essential part of the communities where we live, work, and play. 
what we have started to see, fortunately, is greater intention across corporations, across sports teams, across large philanthropic organizations, recognizing that oversight and also recognizing uh, the intersection with what our workforce increasingly cares about. And what that looks like is greater intention around if I'm ordering lunch, uh, is there an opportunity to order lunch from a small catering company owned by refugee women? Um, if I am purchasing gift cards as a thank you or uh, an incentive or recognition, um, we have seen incredible growth in the sale of intentionalist gift cards, which are digital gift cards that can be used at multiple businesses throughout our network. And then we've also seen companies increasingly reach out to us asking about other ways that they can use their reach and leverage to drive and to catalyze additional spending uh, in support of diverse owned Main Street small businesses. So two quick examples there. Um, one is that we have companies who are subsidizing discounts for their employees uh, who want to spend at black owned or women owned or other diverse owned small businesses, uh, oftentimes as part of their history or heritage month celebration. Uh, we also worked with a variety of companies over the holiday season to curate uh, special resources, uh, highlighting diverse owned independent uh, places for folks to uh, shop and eat over the course of the holiday season. And then as we start to get back to in-person events, anytime we're bringing people together, uh, there's an opportunity to look at the money that we're spending and ask a really simple question, right? And that simple question, which guides intentionalists every day is who benefits? Because when we ask the question of who benefits from the money that we spend and we're intentional about harnessing that spend in direct support in a non-extractive way of Main Street small businesses and the diverse people behind them, we start to close the gaps uh, from an economic and financial perspective. And what's more, we also reflect the, the reality that we wanna be a part of a culture that isn't just about uh, transactional efficiency, but is about what becomes possible when we connect with, know, and support each other. I don't think I've ever heard the word transactional efficiency, those two put together, and I love them so much. I just wrote it down in my notebook. I'm gonna be using that. Um, but I think that what I hear from 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 that is slow it down a little bit, right? Like asking questions takes a little bit more time. Being intentional takes a little bit more time, right? Like it's easier to put an order in on Whole Foods or Amazon or I guess they're the same company, um, right? It's it's it, it is easier, and it may take a, just a little bit more sleuthing to find a really great local business that can do the same thing. And what I realized myself as the owner of a business is that sometimes it doesn't actually cost more. You know, there's a, there's a myth that shopping local is going to cost more or ordering a book directly from the author and their supplier is going to cost more than putting a big order into Amazon. And what I'm learning over time is that that's not always true. And so I wonder, like, as we come to a close in this conversation, are there other myths that we need to bust, you know, when it comes to the importance of shopping local and also I think the ease really of shopping local? So you just touched on the reality that price and convenience are important drivers when it comes to the, to the decisions that we make. Um, and that's a truth. 
That being said, I think that the, the past couple of years, we've been reminded that price and convenience aren't the only things that matter all of the time. There are instances where I might be willing to pay a little bit more because I know that I'm supporting my neighbor, because I know that the neighbor that I'm supporting is providing health insurance, uh, because I know that the neighbor that I'm supporting to, to their employees, um, mm -hmm. because I know that the neighbor that I'm supporting is making uh, free meals available to those in need. And so again, that isn't to say that I wanna dismiss price sensitivity, but I also think that there are a variety of areas in our life where we're willing to pay a little bit of a premium. Um, and while there are many deals to be had and intentional spending doesn't mean spending more, uh, personally, I don't take issue if it does. Um, I think that the second thing that I would say um, is that at least in, in Seattle and in progressive spaces, we have a tendency to think that if you want to make a difference, you need to jump in, you know, 150% with both feet. Um, and that if you are someone who wants to be a more intentional spender, that, you know, you need to go the equivalent of uh, intentional spending vegan. Um, and the <laughs> truth, right, is that Meatless Monday exists for a reason. And it exists because veganism isn't going to be for everyone. And yet, by being more conscious of the impacts of our meat consumption one day a week, if we all do that, the impact is enormous. Similarly, while of course intentionalist is working hard to facilitate a culture shift that ele elevates and celebrates intentional spending in support of main street diverse owned small businesses the truth is that being more intentional about spending at a diverse owned small business in your community once a week goes a long way once a month goes a long way. And while we welcome intentional spending vegans, um, you don't have to only ever shop at diverse owned small businesses in order to make a difference. And you know, I would argue that the, the sustainability of our communities is counting on all of us to recognize that just being a little bit more intentional, right? I mean, 20 plus billion dollars in a single day on Small Business Saturday uh, goes a long way to helping the small businesses at the heart of our communities survive and thrive. Oh, I love it. That is the perfect note to end on. So we don't have to be intentional list vegans, but we can do a Meatless Monday or you know, intentional Tuesday, <laughs> intentional Tuesday, right? Like we can take better care of ourselves and take better care of our communities. So I'm going to keep that analogy in my head. Laura, thank you so much for joining me today morning. Um, and for all of the nuggets, I, you know, like I see you all the time and still like when we talk about the work that you're doing at the intentionalist, every single time I pick up something new, um, and I start to integrate it in my life and, um, I hope that people that tuned in today are going to do some of the same thing. So thank you. And thanks everybody for watching. We'll be back next week on Monday at 930. Thanks.